Hello and welcome to our final lecture for ECE 108 for this week. So in this lecture we're going to talk all about expected value and expectation. So without further ado, let's get into it. Oh, you expect me to talk. So pun aside, let's get into it. Uh, given some sample space S where we can define some PDF PR over S, uh, a discrete random variable is a function from S to R. So what really is a discrete random variable? Well, let's give some examples. The following are examples of discrete random variables. The height of a human taken from the set of all humans. So the set of all of humans is some finite sample space S. We could define probability density functions over the set of all humans. Uh, that occurs all the time for, say, health insurance in the US. Uh, and Height is a property that all humans have, and a height is a real number given some fixed units. So again, this works for many other human properties. You could say weight, age, uh, any quantity of a human that can be described as a real number is an example of a random variable. Okay, so next, the midterm marks for any ECE 108 students. Okay, so we have a bunch of ECE 108 students. I could put a probability density function over them, and the midterm marks is a real number. So this would be an example of a discrete random variable. Next, the numerical results of rolling a die. So a die, when I roll it, it comes up with a number. Uh, I can define probability density functions over the sample space of the results of rolling a die. Therefore, this would be a discrete random variable. Next, any monetary wager that an event from a set of finite events happens, i.e. gambling. So whenever you're putting a monetary value associated for particular events within a discrete sample space, that would be an example of discrete random variables. So now that we have this, we can talk about expectation. The expected value, expectation, or mean of a discrete random variable x, where this is a function that goes from x s to r, so do keep in mind a common thing that people mess up, a discrete random variable is actually a function. So yeah, uh, where PR is the PDF over S is given by the symbol here, E of X with the square brackets. And this is equal to the sum of, over all of the real numbers of X times the probability that capital X is equal to X. Okay, so whenever we do sums like this, we need to be careful to make sure these things are bounded. Well, since S is finite, there are finitely many real numbers such that X will be equal to, such that capital X will be, will be, such that capital X will be equal to little x. Therefore, this is a finite sum. And further, this can be redescribed as this statement here. So this is the set of, all, so this is the sum over all of the S's and S of X of S times PR of S. So previously, you've probably worked with things like averages before, and this expected value is exactly the idea of an average. So any intuition that you have there is probably valid, given that your intuition is not invalid. And do keep in mind, probability can do weird things, but generally speaking, expected value is a little bit more tame than probability as a whole. So now let's compute some averages. What is the expected value of the result of rolling a d6? So to do this, I need two things. I need to know what the PDF is, and I need to compute that sum. So the PDF for rolling a die is a uniform PDF, right? It's the uniform PDF over six elements. So thus, if d is the random variable representing the result of any given roll, the expected value is going to be e of d, and this will be the sum over all the d's and r's of these terms here, or put in a different way, since I know d can range between one and six, this is the sum from i is equal to one to six of i, so that's the result when I roll a number i, uh, times one sixth, and that's just the, coming from the fact that these probabilities are uniform. So from here, I can factor out the one sixth, and I know how to add up all the integers from i is equal to one to six, I used that previously. So this is 1 sixth times this expression here, or 21 over 6. Okay, pretty straightforward. Let's look at a slightly more complex question. What is the expected value of the result of rolling 2d6 and summing the pips? So why is this problem more complex? 
Well, we know the, the PDF of rolling 2d6 and then summoning the pips is not uniform. So this makes this problem a little bit more complex, but it's still pretty straightforward. So again, the PDF for rolling 2d6 and summing the pips is this. We derived this in a previous lecture. I forgot exactly which one, but it was pretty early on. Uh, so thus, if s is the random variable representing the sum of any given roll, the expected value will simply be this e of s, which again is the sum of s times the probability that s is equal to s over all of the s's in R. Uh, and this is simply uh, this this is simply the sum of the top rows times the bottom row here. So two times this plus three times that plus four times this plus five times that, etc. So I don't really want to compute that, right? Like I could do it in Excel if I plugged it in. Like I could do it manually or I could do it in Excel relatively quickly if I wanted to save a little bit of time there. But say if I didn't have a computer and I wanted to compute this quickly without doing all this god awful algebra. Well, if I am clever, I can notice some patterns here. So first, this sum is this thing plus something else. I'll talk about the something else in a second. So if you notice here, this goes 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and the numbers here go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then they start going back down. So let's just handle this first half here where the numbers are getting, or the probabilities are getting bigger. Okay, so if I let i go from 1 up to 6, the, one, uh, the probabilities would be given by i divided by 36, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this controls for this bit here. Okay, next I want the numbers to start at two and go to seven. Well, if I take i plus one, that does precisely that. I go two when I plug in one, all the way up to seven when I plug in six. Okay, so this might not look like it's gonna save me time, but you'll see why it does in a bit. So now I need to handle this second half of the things, right? I need to handle this stuff over here. So how precisely am I going to do that? Well, let's just rewrite that as a different sum. So I could change the index to make it a little bit nicer in some sense, but I don't want to do that. That'll make my life harder later on, and you'll see why. So let's pick the same index starting at i is equal to 1 up to 5. So how does this work? Well, I want to go 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So how can I go about doing that? Well, if I do 6 minus i, if I plug in 1, I start at 5. And if I plug in 5, I go to 1. So this term here is controlling for my probabilities again. And now I want to start at 8 and go 9, 10, 11, 12. Well, the natural way to do that is to take i plus 7. So 1 plus 7 is 8, and I go up to 5 plus 7, which is 12. So this is just a fancy way of saying take this number, multiply it by that number, take this number, multiply it by that number, do that for all of these, and then add them together. Okay, so let's wipe that off. So now that we have this, it turns out that I can rewrite the sum in a useful way that makes my life nice. So let's just expand these terms. So here, if I take this i and multiply it out, this would give me an i squared over 36, and this would give me an i over 36, okay? Straightforward algebra. Secondly, if I multiply these polynomials out, I'm going to get what? Well, when I take six times seven and divide that by 36, that's just going to give me seven over six. When I take my i negative i times seven, and add that to my i times six, I'm going to get a minus one. And again, the 36 hangs around, so I get this term. And finally, negative i times i, that's i squared over 36. Okay, so now I have this sum here, and I can notice a few things. This goes from i is equal to one up to i is equal to six, and this term here appears in the second term with a negative. Further, this term over here appears in the second term with a negative. So when I add these two things together, these are going to cancel for i is equal to one up to five, because that's my limit here. And I'm only going to be left with six squared over 36 for the first term and six over 36 for the second term. So noting that it saves my life, it saves myself a fair bit of time doing all this algebra. So from here, this first term is simply going to be six squared over 36 from the first term of the sum. This next term will be six over 36 from this, and that handles the blue and the red. What's remaining is this last term over here in black. And this is simply taking seven over six and adding it to itself five times. Well, by definition, that's five times seven over six. 
So now I can do this algebra pretty quickly, and that's just 7. So that's kind of handy. Uh, it turns out that that's 7, and 7 is actually the element here in the middle, right? It kind of have this natural symmetry about 7. Uh, so yeah, just a few kind of neat things there to keep in mind. So if I do give you a question that's something like this at some point, uh, do keep in mind that sometimes this trick can be very useful if you can figure out the way of making things collapse nicely. Uh, if you were to just write this out and give me a number for the expected value, if your expected value was wrong, uh, that could be worth a fair bit of points for the question. So do make sure you show work and doing tricks like this uh, go a long way for minimizing algebraic errors. Okay, so now let's look at another very important real world example. Consider the Stardew Valley game where you bet on green or orange and the probability that green wins is 0.75. Suppose you wanna make a bet of $100 now. If you win, you double your money. What is the expected return if you bet on green? What about if you bet on orange? Okay, so now we're going to let m be a random variable representing the amount of money you will make from any given bet. Then what? Well, then the expected value if you bet on green will simply be the expected value of m, which will be $200 since we're putting all of that weighing on green uh, times 0 0.75 plus 0 since we're not betting anything on orange times its probability. So in this case, it's $150 is the expected about amount of money we expect to get back if we bet 100. Now, if I vote on orange, the expected value will simply be this thing here where I have zero for green since I'm not putting money on green and I have 200 for orange. And in this case, I get 50. So here it's a good idea to always bet green as opposed to this betting of orange. Okay, so we have one more example and we are done for these slides. It's kind of a short lecture. Suppose there's a lottery with a $100 million prize. In this lottery, there's five numbers that are chosen at random from a collection of 27 letters. Letters are allowed to be repeated and the order of letters matters. So if I get A, A, B, B, A, that's different than if I were to get B, B, A, 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 just as an example. Each ticket costs $5. Should I buy some tickets? So we should buy a ticket or multiple tickets if the expected value of a ticket is greater than its cost, right? This is similar to the Stardew Valley case over here. It's worth it to make the bet where I bet on green since I can gain money, but it's not worth it to bet on orange. For the lottery company, they want their tickets to always be in this category, but they may or may not be, and that's something you can check them on and maybe make money if they make a oopsie. Uh, okay, so from here, I really want to compute what is the average value of a ticket? What are my returns going to be? So the average value of a ticket will simply be the amount of money that I could win times the probability that I have a winning ticket. So in this case, since there's 23 letter combinations and I'm picking five letters taken at random where order matters and I'm allowed to repeat uh, letters, this is simply going to be 1 over 27 to the fifth. fifth. 1 because I bought one ticket, 27 to the fifth because I have, because that's the number of possible tickets here. So this one I chase it out is 6.96. So in this case, a $5 investment, so if I buy one single ticket, on average will yield $6.96 in returns. This is a pretty good deal to be honest. So in this case, we should buy some tickets. So one thing to note here, this has happened in the past before, and you can look at this article here for the details for at least one situation. Okay, so we have some assigned reading. I want you to read pages 89 through 91. Here I covered example 30 already, but I did not cover example 31, so that one's new for you to look at. And there's also another example of a coin toss game that they use when introducing expectations, so you can look at that if you wanna see more examples there. Okay, and we have our meme for the week. Expectation, this is expectation. Reality, you just get one value of x. So the lesson that this meme is kind of hinting at is that in reality, you pick one of the particular values that the random variable can take on. And when you compute the expectation, that's just the average or a weighted average of all of those values. So you may or may not ever actually see the expected value 
actually ever occur in reality. So for instance, if we look at the dice rolls, the expected value was a non-integer, but we know that dice rolls are always going to be integers, right? So that's just something to keep in mind here. As always, have a wonderful weekend, and I will talk to you next week for our last week of lectures.